What are some of our own development challenges? We have high unemployment and underemployment, um, and crucially, these are concentrated amongst women as well as amongst young men. Right? So if we disaggregate our employment picture um, by gender as well as by age, we find that it's highly concentrated in particular pockets um, of our demographic. Uh, growth and economic um, challenges in the region are exemplified in this, this issue of unemployment um, by the phenomenon of the working poor. Um, which again many of us are familiar with, that is the poor in the Caribbean typically are not completely unemployed. Um, oftentimes people are engaged in various forms of work but simply cannot make enough um, in order to raise themselves and their households um, above the poverty line. We have a low productivity economic structure. Um, the sectors of our economy that are designed to produce output, so um, in agriculture, in manufacturing, as well as in services. So across the three main areas of the productive sectors in our economies across the region, really are quite weak in some fundamental ways, which I'll talk a little bit more about this morning. Well, we're trapped in arenas of production that have limited capacity to benefit from booms in a dynamic global economy. And at the same time, we're highly vulnerable to busts. Um, and this really goes to our service and commodity um, dynamic. Um, we're highly open to the global, econ uh, the global economy. So Caribbean economies are amongst the most open in the world. Um, our trade to GDP ratios average anywhere from about 125 to 150 um, percent. It's extremely high. I mean, the global average, even amongst developing countries, is around 70 to 75 percent. Um, another source of our vulnerability um, around our high exposure to international trade really relies on the fact that we have a very small number of major trading partners. Right. So again, we're very exposed to and, uh, the kinds of economic challenges that those countries may face. It should also be noted that our patterns of trade, so we're heavily reliant on the United States as well as the UK and Canada, really reflects um, uh, quite strongly um, the, kind of the ways in which our economic structures are really tied into our post-colonial um, situation. That is, um, our reliance on the United Kingdom, of course, still reflects um, colonial economic ties. Um, and the United States um, and Canada, to uh, no small extent, also reflect sort of newer, uh, new imperial um, ties. The second way that we're heavily exposed to international finance is through our sovereign debt. And now this is very crucial. Uh, sovereign debt in the Caribbean, um, one of the important features of our debt, which again is quite different from many other developing countries, um, is the extent to which our sovereign debts are held um, by market, private market actors. So we hold private debt as opposed to sovereign debt that are held by other countries or by the international financial institutions. This means, amongst other things, that we're highly vulnerable to the vagaries of international financial markets. Um, the global financial crisis of a few years ago is just one example of the types of exposures that we face. So economic impacts are faced most quickly in sectors that we've been trying to diversify towards. So even as we try to diversify our economies, we've diversified to a large extent into sectors um, that are even more vulnerable. So services trade, as I mentioned, um, tourism, but also financial services. Um, and again, there are other additional issues that arise with the kind of financial services um, diversification that we've uh, attempted um, in the Caribbean, particularly in the Eastern Caribbean, if we think about offshore finance um, and some of the issues that have arisen um, there with um, tax and money laundering uh, questions. Tourism is the most important um, industry for our region, um, yet the contribution of tour or the sort of the expected long-term growth of tourism in our region is almost the worst globally. But unsurprisingly to many of us, um, when we think about the contribution to employment in relative terms, that is relative to other industries within the region, um, we're near and at the top um, in both categories. So again, really thinking about the sort of central role of tourism in our region, the extent to which um, we're highly exposed and how this exposure um, has served to hurt us um, over the course of the last 10 or 20 years. Besides our economic challenges, there are social challenges that go along as well, and these are closely interrelated. Um, and these fall along a range of um, dimensions, so gender, class, race, um, and others. Um, so high levels of crime and violence, um, which um, sadly are increasingly pervasive across the region. Uh, in addition, um, various health challenges, um, not least vulnerability to um, uh, HIV AIDS, um, which I mentioned for two reasons. Um, first, because of the gendered dimensions of HIV, um, the gendered vulnerabilities um, that go with HIV. And second, um, to the extent that um, d uh, diseases like um, HIV AIDS are closely related to our particular economic structures. Um, and in this sense, for example, um, the role of tourism um, in uh, the HIV AIDS epidemic um, is something that is important for us to note. 
So we have to understand the kind of interrelations between our vulnerabilities, both social and economic, with the particular structures um, of our economies, particularly to the extent that the structures reflect the kinds of strategies that we've been pursuing. Uh, and finally, of course, ecological and climate disasters. Um, so we've been living with these for many decades, in fact, um, even though it's really just in the last 10 or 15 years um, that this discussion really has gained steam in the, in the sort of larger global discussions, um, as perhaps best exemplified by the post-2015 um, uh, discussions around the SDGs. The, the, re the rationale for pointing to these kinds of vulnerabilities really lie on the ultimate effects on households and individuals. And these effects, of course, for us are most pertinent in the context of poverty. Um, and so this is just a very quick snapshot view um, of poverty rates across the region, and this is taken from um, the CDFB country poverty assessment data, um, that shows very high levels of poverty um, across the region, um, ranging from about 14% in Barbados um, all the way up uh, above 35% um, in St. Vincent um, and almost, and even higher, excuse me, um, in Dominica. Right, so this is just a, a, a quick way of trying to, to suggest that these kinds of vulnerabilities um, uh, it, we see in economic growth and employment um, are not abstract. Right? They have direct implications um, for households, for communities um, across the region. And this is where I think much of our focus ultimately um, has to rely, um, particularly on the gendered elements of this poverty. Um, it's been observed in the Caribbean that the gender wage gap is very significant. Now, if we think about the Caribbean relative to other countries in the world, and we find that the ratio of women's to men's earnings um, ranges from 40% in Belize to 63% in Barbados. In the Caribbean, as many of us know, women tend to have higher levels of educational attainment than men. So, this creates a paradox. Why? Because in orthodox economics suggests that wage differentials really are based on um, access to income generating resources, human capital or education being the most important, However, of course, uh, women um, in the region of higher educational attainment than men. So how can we explain this paradox? That's the question, or it's one of the questions I'd like to put on the table. So there are two ways we can think about this. We think like an economist, right? So on, first, on one hand, we can think from the supply side. So education and skills, which is what um, workers bring to the table. So what we find is that women have higher levels of educational attainment. Um, but crucially, in trying to understand um, this puzzle, one solution, one, um, one potential reason that we can put forward is that there's different value that is, that's ascribed to the types of skills that men and women have. That is to say, another way of saying that is, there's women's work and there's men's work. So for example, you see that men tend to go into areas of science and technology. These tend to be higher paying um, areas on average um, than in the humanities, for example. Which is to say, somebody with a bachelor's degree in science and technology is more likely to have higher earning capacity than someone with a bachelor's degree in humanities. So the similar level of attainment, but in a different area. That's what we can think about in the post-secondary tertiary level. Um, but even if we think about it in, with lower skill levels, right, we can think about clerical work versus construction work. Um, but we know, for example, that construction jobs tend to pay much more um, than jobs, let's say, at gas stations or being a clerk in a supermarket. Um, the second thing, and sort of related, is the way that economists cite this is um, called labor market sorting, which is to say that uh, different members of the labor market sort themselves into different areas. So women and men, for instance, tend to sort themselves into different um, occupations. Um, and this has to do with various gender norms that exist in our societies. So gender shapes the courses of study that are pursued by boys and girls. Um, in turn, this results in gendered patterns of skills and employment, um, ultimately with implications for the kinds of gender wage disparities that I described earlier. I'm going to use the example of Barbados. It's a service-oriented economy, so it speaks to many of um, particular uh, countries um, in the OECS. So this is just a pie chart that um, div sort of divides uh, the entire Barbados labor market um, by industry. The three that I want to highlight which are very important um, is this uh, sector in light blue, which is construction. Uh, this one in this kind of funny yellowish color, um, which is wholesale and retail trade. Um, and the third um, in sort of this purple, uh, which is tourism. So these are the three dominant sectors um, in the Barbadian economy. And again, this will be very similar to many other countries in our region. Um, together, they account for almost 70% um, of employment. So this takes that exact same data I just showed a moment ago um, and divides um, and sort of disaggregates it by gender. So we can see where women and men are within 
these sectors. Well, for example, in the construction industry, unsurprisingly, the red bar is men and the blue bar is women, and men dominate significantly in construction. When infrastructure investments take place, they're often heralded because they bring in lots of money. They you know, hopefully provide needed infrastructure and so forth, but also they provide jobs in the construction phase. And a big question that's been ongoing in our region, of course, is how those jobs are allocated. And the reality is that in construction, since it tends to be dominated by men, um, that's where most of the jobs go. So by contrast, we look at wholesale and retail trade um, and tourism, we see women have a slight majority in terms of the proportion of employment in these areas. Um, we have other potential um, factors to take into consideration. So one is gender-based discrimination. So women's job searches are often much greater than men's, for example, because of their greater household responsibilities. It's, there, are various, there are barriers that are in place um, in searching for work. Um, employers may often prefer to hire men um, for a whole variety of reasons. Um, for example, men may, uh, employers may perceive men to be more available, um, largely due to the gender distribution of um, responsibilities within the household. Right? So you know, women are seen oftentimes as taking off of work more because they have to take care of children and so forth, whether or not this may be actually true. Um, so this is a form of discrimination in the labor market. Um, and then also labor market data um, in the region suggests that there may be disguised unemployment, which is to say women are more likely to work as unpaid family labor, particularly in areas like agriculture. Right? So there may be some problems with the ways in which we um, interpret um, some of our labor market data. But again, crucially, for our purposes, these fall along important gender lines. And uh, along with these challenges, we also, um, fortunately, uh, may be facing a number of potential opportunities. Now, one of the things that I think is really prescient for us um, here in the Caribbean is that we have a very rich tradition um, of heterodox economic thinking. Um, this really goes back to the late 1960s and early 1970s, um, probably best exemplified um, by a paradigm which was known um, as plantation economy. I mean, the crucial thing with the plantation economy framework um, was that it focused quite specifically on understanding the particular social, political, and economic structures that characterized the Caribbean and made it different from other parts of the world. Um, this stood quite in opposition um, with the kind, kinds of ideas that were central to the Washington Consensus, which really suggested that all economies everywhere are the same. Therefore, one set of policies um, can fit all. It's so very much a one-size-fits-all policy paradigm that, that uh, um, really exemplified um, the types of positions that the Bretton Woods institutions took. Um, so what I'd like to suggest is that the opportunities that we face today really lie with generating an understanding of the specific kinds of challenges that we face in the re region, um, and then from that standpoint, trying to determine what are some solutions that might be put in place. And crucially, um, I think, and this again has been my personal as well as professional experience, um, one of the things that's um, really quite encouraging is that there may be significant opportunity for these heterodox economic ideas really to be led by feminist critiques. Um, so hopefully um, what I've, I've tried to do here is to provide a very broad framing that will allow us to think about, on one hand, um, the potential role of ideas that we can generate um, using frameworks from heterodox political economy, um, feminist social and political theory, um, as well as political ecology to start to think about the kinds of um, ecological and environmental impacts of some of the dynamics that I've pointed to. Uh, and secondly, um, really thinking about ways in which the kind of shifts in the global political economy that I outlined um, in the first part of my discussion um, may offer new opportunities for carving out fiscal space um, for development interventions, um, for designing new industrial policies that will allow us to diversify our economies but in ways that reduce our vulnerabilities and not perhaps paradoxically increase them. Um, that allow us to, to seek new forms of ecological justice um, so we can try to limit the impacts um, on our environment of some of these um, changes, particularly the ones that we can control. Uh, and finally, and I think this is very crucial for our group, um, a central, central to all of this will be civil society engagement. Um, and here I think in the Caribbean we really need new institutional modes of engagement between civil society organizations um, and governments, as well as uh, regional and international development institutions. And this, I think, is the area that we have the most control over, the ways in which we engage, in, excuse me, engage with um, governmental and international organizations, and hopefully the ways in which we can inject new modes of thinking, new types of engagement, new kinds of discussions that ultimately can lead to developmental benefits. Thank you.